I'm only a child, yet I know we are all in this together and should act as one single world towards one single goal. There is enough for everybody's need, but not for anybody's greed. We are facing something profoundly uh, important. We have never faced this before. The term green economy itself suggests an emphasis on the dual ecological and economic dimensions of a solution. But the definition provided, I think, particularly by UNEP is one that does explicitly incorporate social goals. To quote, a green economy is one that results in improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities based upon a combination of low carbon growth, resource efficiency, and social inclusivity. So in a broad interpretation, this may approximate the notion of sustainable development. The two key convictions I can identify in the Green Economy Project are first, that there is a triple crisis, depending on one's perspective. The first is a socio-political crisis. The second is an economic crisis. The third is a broader ecological crisis. Second key conviction is that the ecological crisis can, in fact, be harnessed to solve all three of them. And this is the central point. The ecological crisis isn't necessarily solved in the project, but it is used as a driver to drive a new round of economic growth. And it's a crisis of. It's not one of those that we can simply manage in the old way, but is a fundamental challenge to our ways of thinking about crises, of crisis management. We would argue that the green economy paradigm is very much uh, within the sort of crisis in the system uh, framework, whereas the global justice uh, thinking uh, is looking at this as a crisis of the system. So it's a much more overarching systemic critique. So when we debate on this whole question of what is the green economy, what would it look like? It's being narrated at present as capitalism's best hope to create jobs, restore growth and limit climate change, a magic formula or magic bullet. Its strengths clearly lie in the fact that it is one of the very few projects currently that has a coherent, but not necessarily correct, proposal for addressing all three parts of the triple crisis. Its second strength lies in the fact that it has a strategy to create a social base for its own project. So good thing about the ecological modernization is that they acknowledge that the, the, the current crisis or the crisis, environmental crisis of the century uh, uh, were been made were the result of the industrialization and modernization. But when it comes to solution, they think that you know, our technological and procedural innovations will solve the problem. So in other words, they try to solve the, the contradiction between economy and ecology within the capitalist mode of production. But it also, precisely because it's a floating signifier, because of its productive fuzziness, it creates the possibilities of false alliances, misreadings, of takeovers, of colonization, and so forth. It has a certain incoherence, and it is vulnerable to capture by the most powerful economic and political forces. Among the concerns about a green economy are inevitably questions about equity, justice, and the link with development. Will a green economy transition center on technological fixes and business as usual, or will it conversely be seized as an opportunity to enhance well-being and transform the social structures, institutions, and power relations that underpin various forms of vulnerability and inequality? Its weaknesses are threefold. First, 
it clearly represents the danger of the emergence of a new green Washington consensus articulated by the North, used to impose policies on the global South and, and close off space for other alternatives. The second problem is that it doesn't and can't address the problem of growth, the problem of infinite growth on a finite planet, because it focuses on the extremely distant possibility of decoupling economic growth from environmental destruction. And then there is, of course, the whole question of distribution. Uh, we know that there are poor countries and rich countries. Of course, it's not a dichotomy. But there are also poor people within both rich and poor countries. If those in the north want to preserve what they have, it's minus growth for the south or being paid off, bought off. And we have the terrible experience of the structural adjustment programs during the 1980s and 1990s, and the impacts were quite terrible, and we're still paying for that in terms of human capital. I think it's also very important to demystify this vicious, per, sort of perverse circle that says, well, you know, climate change affects the poor, but the poor need to grow, need to develop, therefore we need more growth, therefore we need to continue business as usual. How to construct hope is one of the, the major issues uh, if you want to bring, uh, bring social dimension to, to economy. There are questions and choices here and challenges for production, for consumption, for distribution, and finally, of course, for transformation. And this new transformation we are suggesting must be different from prior structural transformations associated with the development process, all of which were highly carbon intensive. Technological fixes for political, economic, and socio-ecological crises are undemocratic and unsustainable. How to leapfrog this development, to use the, the, a bit of the, the usual term, um, how can they skip uh, the same path of development that richer countries in the north did, which are very carbon intensive or chemical intensive and so on? Who has power from the current status quo? Who benefits from the position now, who profits from that, in, uh, if you want to look at the economics of it, and who has the power to make those changes. And so the concept of power must be central to all of the analysis that we do as we look forward. We, we find that gender equality is very strongly associated with good performance uh, in environmental terms, and that this is true even if you just take high growth countries um, and you look within that subset, we still find that the strongest environmental performance tends to be from the countries with greatest gender equality. The real changes here, I think, are mostly institutional. Building regulations, a discussion of norms and values around what it means to be uh, a global citizen today. If we're talking of a situation right now that is unsustainable, and that's why we want to change it. Science has given us a problem that science has no solution. That the solution lies in seeing it from a human perspective, seeing it from a social science perspective. The big um, window of opportunity is for people to mobilize because now it's time to change.